So um, I, can't my notes. I, I can't read your notes. But um, you know what? We we have taken some time this summer to really evaluate what God has told us to do. You ever do that? You're doing work. You're doing work for God. It's like, what are we really supposed to be doing? So Tina and I have talked about this, especially this week, a lot. And we feel that God had, uh, through a couple different um, prophecies that we receive and God's fulfilling, that one of, the, one of the main things that we should do, or that we really feel that we, we're going to tell you today, is that we need to be your mama and dad. All right? And we have embraced that, and we have done that. We've seen that happen. But it's like God has burned in us now this new, over and over, over, and over again, how we are to help you and, and comfort you and show you his word and, and help build you up for the ministry because that's really what we're here for, right? Everybody has a ministry. We just have to know what it is, amen? And so we want to do that. We want to encourage you, of course, love you and cry with you and just encourage you. So uh, this week we've been talking about that, how, how God has put so many different people in our lives, different old people, younger people, in the middle people. It doesn't matter but how we've been able to not just do church like this, but just in our home and loving and just being part of our family. And so if you know, get to know Tina, that's what she wants. She wants you, when you come here, it's like coming to our house. So when we have dinner next week, she'll be running around making sure all the plates are there, all the food, there's enough. If there's not enough food, she'll be making them in the kitchen just so everybody has enough to eat, amen? But that's just what Obama does, right? Because my son came in last night from Purdue University. He's speaking at another church in town. He's a campus pastor there. And so guess what she did at 8 o'clock at night? She got the meat out, she got some veggies out, she's cooking up some fiddles. It was awesome. And, the, and my son goes, oh, it's good to be home, you know, because mom's cooking. And that's what we want to do. So anyway, I just want to throw it out because we want to, at the end of service today, we're going to be praying for you, all right? And we want to pray for you. Tina's going to pray for the ladies. I'm going to be praying for the men. We want to, we want to, we want to um, impart into you that family, that love, the unity of being in community and, and all that, we want to just impart it to you. And, um, okay, I, I'm not going to say anymore. That's, that's, that's good, is that right? Sure. All right, all right. You Let's pray. Pastor. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you yes. for the word yes. that you're about to give us. Let this meal be satisfying to our spirit today. Let it challenge us. Let us recognize who we are in you, Lord God. And I thank you for blessing that she brings a word today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So if you got a bulletin, you saw that, that the title for our message today is Prepare the Way. And uh, we have been reading a book, and I, this part of this particular chapter just jumped off the pages at me. You know, it's just like, oh my goodness, I never thought about it this way before. So... Hence the reason why we're having this message this morning. So we're going to start with the definition of a forerunner. Definition of a forerunner. As a noun, it is a person or thing that precedes the coming or development of someone or something else. So an example would be the icebox of the early years was the forerunner to our refrigerator today. Okay? As a synonym, you know, something similar to that would be a predecessor, a precursor, an antecedent, an ancestor, forebear, prototype. Now, I would never know, I probably did, but completely forgot that an, let me see, archosaur, archosaurus were the forerunners of a dinosaur. I thought there were just dinosaurs. So I even learned something with this, right? So there was a precursor. There was something before the dinosaurs that we heard about, all right? A sign of warning or something to come, a forerunner. During the American Revolution, Paul Revere got his message from the steeple of the Old North Church. When he got that message, he jumped and he ran, and everybody already knows what he said, right? The British are coming, the British are coming. Paul Revere was an example of a forerunner. He was going out preparing the people in the area. 
hey, let's get ready. The British are coming. We have to be ready. The fight's going to begin. All right? So the next thing, if we want to think about that, today's forerunners, as today's forerunners, we are to receive our message from the Holy Spirit. Just like Paul received his message from that upper room in the steeple that told him, hey, the British are coming because the thing was, you know, one of by whatever, two of by, right? So he got that message. We too are supposed to, in our upper room experience, our quiet time with Holy Spirit, we're supposed to receive the message to go out as a forerunner to proclaim, to let the people know. Now, I also want to look at a definition, and I promise I'm going to tie all of these things together, okay? So the definition of a best man. I looked that up, you know, not that I didn't know it, but I thought maybe I would just check it and see what the uh, dictionary had to say. So the definition of a best man, the bridegroom's chief attendant at a wedding. And we know that. You know, we've seen that happen, just like if for a bride, the maid of honor, she's the one who's, who's the attendant. She's the one who makes sure that everything gets taken care of. The, the best man is the one who carries the rings. The best man is the one who arranges the party ahead of time. The best man makes sure that everything for the groom is prepared. Now, there's a little bit of history, and Daniel, please, you probably know some of this too. If I, may, if I get some of it wrong, let me know. But for the Jewish wedding, there, there was a, a custom. They would come in, they would have the, they, they'd sign the document, right? And they would seal the covenant that they were going to get married with a cup of wine. And then the bride would go to her house, and the groom would go to his house, and he would prepare a place. He'd get the house ready. Now, during that time, they, of course, were married, and if they were going to divorce, there would actually have to be a decree of divorcement because they were considered married at that time, just not living together. Well, the time would come when Daddy would say, okay, I think the house is ready. Go get your bride. And the, the bridegroom would go out, but he wouldn't go out by himself. There was somebody that ran ahead of him. So while they were getting the house ready, the bride and her attendants were waiting. I want us to take a look at this. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 7 says this. And I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. They were thoughtless and without forethought. And five were wise. They were sensible and intelligent and prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take away any extra oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil along, and they also had their rings. While the bridegroom lingered, and it could have been a really long time, while the bridegroom lingered, he was slow in coming. They all began nodding their heads, and they fell asleep. But at midnight, do you see that? But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and put their own lambs in order. And we know the rest of the story, but the part that I wanted to see is that the forerunner, the best man, went on ahead and said, Behold, the bridegroom is here. Get up. Wake up. Wake up, you sleepers. Come and see the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. There was a forerunner that was basically just like Paul Revere. The British are coming, but instead, this best man was crying out, Behold, behold, the bridegroom is coming. 
Get up. Wake up. The friend of the bridegroom, the best man, okay? The best man does not seek to draw any attention to himself. In the Jewish ceremony, the Jewish wedding, the role of that bridegroom was not only to make sure that the groom was taken care of, but he was also to attend to the bride. He was to make sure that she didn't get distracted by anything. The role of the best man was that he was to make sure that she kept her eyes focused on the groom. He was not to draw any attention to himself. He was not to say, hey, baby, you look pretty good. Don't you want to come be with me instead of him? That was not his role. He was to keep her eyes focused on him and him alone. And then when the time came to cry out ahead, as a forerunner. So if we look at this pattern, the friend of the bridegroom was a forerunner and went through and before the bridegroom, preparing the way. So if we flip over to John chapter 3, verse 29, we're going to see a friend of the bridegroom. This is John. John is speaking about himself here at this point. So John chapter 3, verse 29 says this. He who asks the bride is the bridegroom. But the groomsman who stands by and listens to him rejoices greatly and heartily on account of the bridegroom's faith, a voice. This then is my pleasure and joy. And now it is complete. So when you see here, John is saying, I, I know that Jesus, you're the groom. Because you have the bride. I recognize, and of course the bride is you and I, right? The church, all right? I recognize this, but I'm standing here. I'm in your presence. And I hear your voice. And my joy is full knowing that you have the bride. If you look at John and his attention and what he did during his life, all he did for that two years was cry in the wilderness, right? Prepare the way of the Lord. Come and meet Jesus. He is the one that we've been waiting for. He never brought any attention to himself. In fact, if you go into um, Isaiah, and this is really interesting because when he quote, quoted, um, it showed that, that he... Um, New Isaiah 40, verse 3 through 5, and it said, A voice of one who cries, Prepare in the wilderness the way of the Lord. Clear away the obstacles. Make straight and smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted and filled up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked and uneven shall be made straight and level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory the majesty and splendor of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. John the Baptist knew that's who he was. Because when the Pharisees came to ask him, who, who are you? What are you doing? And he quoted, I am the one in the wilderness. I am the one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord, get ready, because it's coming. That was uh, in John chapter 1, if you wanted to make a note of it. John chapter 1, 22 through 27. And I thought it was interesting when he finished it. So he, he, he's quoting, he says, Then they said to him, Who are you? Tell us, so that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying aloud in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, and the messengers had been sent from the Pharisees. And they said to him, Then why are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, or not Elijah, or the prophet? John answered them, I only baptize with water. Among you there stands one whom you do not recognize, and with whom you are not acquainted, and of whom you know nothing. It is he 
who, coming after me, it is he who coming, who's coming after me, is preferred before me, the string of whose sandal I am not worthy to unloose. Forerunners prepare the way for the Lord. That's what they do. They prepare the people. Think about this. They prepare the people to respond rightly to Jesus when he comes. John kept telling them ahead of time, before Jesus was in full ministry, John prepared. He told them to repent and be baptized. Repent from your ways. Prepare. Make your way straight. That's what he did. So those forerunners, friends of the bridegroom, prepare the way ahead. God raises up forerunners, messengers, is another good word, I think, for them. He prepares us as a way, a merciful ministry to the people that are here on earth, to us. Because, think about it, if God were to come in in full intensity without us being ready, who would be able to stand? Who would be able to stand? Not a one of us. But the forerunners, the messengers, go out just a little bit ahead. Just one step ahead of what the Lord is doing. Now the intensity of those appearings, those intensities of the Lord's end time, and I really truly believe, and I think that's why it's so burning in my spirit, that we are even closer. I think we've all probably heard, this is the end times, this is the end times, we're there, we're there, right? But when you look at what's happening, we are so close to Jesus returning. We are so close. And so I burn within my heart. I say, God, I, I, we've got to tell the people. We've got to, just like the cry at midnight, behold, the bride, bridegroom, wake up. Wake up, O sleeper. Recognize what time we're in and be ready. Be ready. I believe there's going to be a strong revival that comes before the very end because God is a merciful God. There are so many different ministries, different streams of his love that recognize the time we're in. And they're crying out, be ready. Be ready. Jesus is coming. He's going to be here. Be ready. God is preparing the earth. All of us, believe or non-believer, that there is a happening going to be coming. And we need to be ready for it. Whether it's revival or whether it's judgment, he's preparing everyone. So these activities, these things that God does, really shows his mercy and his love for his people. He loves us, right? We know John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish. He doesn't want any to perish, but that all would come. All would have eternal life. That's what he wants. His desire was never to send his creation to heaven. It was never his desire. He loves us with a love that we cannot even begin to understand, right? It is so far beyond us, so far above us. So as these intense things begin, as revival or judgment begins, we, we can tend to lose focus on what's happening, right? If we see things that are happening today even, let's just look at the events in the news, the world events. It's easy to get caught up in all of the newscasts. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, oh my goodness. You know, and then fear and all these other things begin to try and creep in.
But we as believers need to keep our eyes focused Amen. on God. Because what this is telling us is that this is coming soon. This is coming soon. He is the one that we lean on. He is the rock that does not move. We can believe everything that he told us. He is our provider. He is the one who's going to see us through no matter what. Nothing is going to come against us that we can't stand because he's the strength. He's the one who's going to help us through every situation. So, don't lose sight. Don't look horizontally. Let's not look this way. Let's look this way. You know, right? Isn't there a scripture that says somewhere, look, you know, my salvation, my redemption comes from the hills, right? Where does it come from? It's not here. Let's keep our eyes focused. With his love and his mercy, we are going to be able to answer the questions. Think about it. Everything that's going on, it's setting it up for us to be able to walk in and say, Behold, the bridegroom, he's coming. You need to be ready. Let me share with you what he's done for us. Forerunners make a sense. Friends of the bridegroom, messengers, we make a sense of what's God doing. And I want to use this example of Noah. Now, we know historically that up until the, the flood, how did the earth get watered? It came up from this way. It did not come from this way. So now, can you imagine somebody who's never seen rain, right? They don't know what rain is, and there Noah is, building this boat. I mean, really, right? Okay, are you kidding me? Rain, what's that? You are off your rocker. You do not know what you're talking about. Water does not come from the sky, and it certainly does not flood. But what did Noah do? No matter what was going around him, he kept his eyes focused on what God had told him, what he knew his, his, what his destiny was, what he was supposed to be doing. Can you imagine the conversation? They come up and say, Noah, you're nuts. He said, but no, really, God told me this. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Okay, Noah. Okay. We'll believe you when it starts. And so he builds the ark. It's complete. The animals start coming in, and everything starts getting set up. Right, the rain starts, and they start realizing, what is this? This is what Noah has been talking about all along. He was trying to make sense. He was preparing the way. All of those people had the opportunity. I'm sure that, you know, God would have made a provision. Something would have happened if they had only listened and believed. So a forerunner can make sense of what's happening in the world right now. We can go before Forerunners um, also function within a specific message in different, different spheres of life. Different things that we do, right? Think of some examples of what a messenger might be or what they might do. Um, they could be preachers, but not always. Because when somebody recognizes that he's a preacher, they like... They change immediately. They don't necessarily listen because they don't want to hear what the preacher has to say. They could be preachers or evangelists. How about artists, like singers, painters, writers? Um, how about uh, media? Think about the internet, the movies, the different things that we have available to us today. Messengers can use all sorts of different things. How about... Um, Messengers in the marketplace, you and your job, or your classroom, on the campus, your neighbors in the building where you live, or on the street where you, where you have your place, that your abode, right? I mean, think about it. In the marketplace, how about 
moms, sisters, aunts and uncles, grandma, grandpa, all of us, we fill a very specific role as a messenger of God to make sense of what's, what's going on. I can remember when the kids were little and we would watch television, different programs, and, and, and even though it maybe wasn't a Christian program, well, what do you think God's word has to say about that? Would that make him happy? Would that encourage someone else if you were to do this? We make sense. We have that opportunity. Even if it's little windows of opportunity, each one of us have an opportunity where we're at to make sense, to give an answer of what's going on to the people that we're with. John, I'm sure, from very early on knew that he was going to be the forerunner for Jesus. I mean, after all, he leapt with inside his mother's womb when Mary came and was bearing Jesus. He knew from the very beginning, and think about this, for his life, for 20 years, he prepared for two years of ministry as the forerunner. That was it. He knew what his destiny was, he prepared, and he was ready to go. He said, when they asked him, who are you, and what do you have to say for yourself? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So he knew, I am the voice. John prepared the people to respond accordingly. That's what his job was. They were to respond to God in, in all of the unique things that were going to be happening at that time. He prepared them. The forerunner's voice, the bridegroom, or the the best friend of the bridegroom. Our voice speaks of the things that are yet to come with clarity, with power, and with boldness. That's our job. Not to shrink back, not to speak in half truth, you know? Not to you know, make it as though, well, if I were to say this, they may not listen to me, but if I just say enough, just a little bit, that's not fulfilling the calling that God has put on our lives. If we know the answer, by God, stand up, put both feet down, and speak it with boldness. Because you do not have to fear them. You don't need to fear man, but you need to fear God. How are you going to answer for the answer that you give? Right? And I'm just as guilty, okay? If I, if I go like this and I'm pointing at you, guess how many are pointing back at me? I mean, I know you've heard that, but this, is, this, this was what was burning in my, in my spirit. Don't just be nicey-nicey. And have our church face on and praise the Lord, glory to God. Oh, he's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, you look so beautiful this morning. Oh, yes, I'll pray for you. And then not do it. Not give an answer for why you are happy. Why is there peace in my house? And you can have that same peace, too. Let me tell you how you can have it. Right? By being a friend to them. Not a Bible thumper. But as a friend. Build a relationship with them so that they can see there's a difference. Give an answer boldly and proclaim when you're asked. And the window is open. And the Holy Spirit says, now's the time. And if he says, Now's not the time. Don't say a word. <laughs> because that's the wrong time to do it, right? Now's not the time, okay. So speak it with clarity and power and boldness. 
One crying in the wilderness. And when I thought about that portion, what kind of wildernesses are there? You know, I, I try to think of the wilderness. When we were in sin, we were in the wilderness. We were in Egypt. You know, let's, let's, let's go with that a little bit. In the wilderness, out where it seems like it's such a dry and weary place. We as believers can find our place there sometimes too, can't we? Out in the wilderness, God, why have you brought me here? I do not understand what's going on. What was me? I am the only one here. There's no one else. I think there were a couple prophets that cried that out too, you know. And then he opened their eyes. Know that when you are in the wilderness, whatever wilderness, wherever you find yourself, if you're in the world and in the marketplace, proclaim you are that voice, that one crying in the wilderness to let the people know, prepare the way. Get ready. God is coming. Make straight the way of the Lord. This can sometimes probably be difficult. We are to make clear without any compromise we are to make clear, without any compromise, what God is saying and what he's doing. Not to sugarcoat it. Not to tell them what they really want to hear. But to say it without compromise, the truth. To speak the truth. Make straight the way of the Lord. Make clear. Get rid of the obstacles. Move them out of the way. That's our job. As a forerunner, we've all been called. John chapter 3, verse 21, or 29 said, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of what the bridegroom, because of the bridegroom's voice. And John declared, because he did what, what he was destined to do, what he was called to do, his joy was full because he knew he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. So the thought comes, if your joy is not full, first question, are you fulfilling what the bridegroom has told you to do? Are you? Are you ready to do that? Do you know what you should be proclaiming and declaring ahead? Are you ready to give an answer? Because I guarantee that when you hear the bridegroom's voice and, when he, and you do what he's asked you to do, you too will be able to say this joy is fulfilled. So I want to go back to that verse about the ten virgins. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 7. Now we can look at this and we can say, well, if this story is all about the ten virgins, they were all believers. They were all there. You know, we've heard the sermon about the fact that the oil is the Holy Spirit and spending time in God's presence, and all of that is true, 100%. Five of them were in great relationship, great relationship with Father God. But the other five, if you read the rest of that story, when they went out, they went out to buy more oil, to try and gain more oil, and when they had it, 
they came back to the house where the party was. And they knocked on the door and they said, Lord, Lord, let us in. And he came to the door. And his response was not the one that they were looking for. He said, depart, I never knew you. I don't know who you are, why are you here? They were more interested in what is it going to do for me? I want to go to the party. I want to enjoy the fellowship here at the party. So the warning that we can take is, number one, we are forerunners. We're the ones who are supposed to be preparing the way. Let's wake up. Get ready because the bridegroom is coming. And we don't want to be the ones at the last minute waking up and recognizing I have to fill my, I have to be filled with this oil. And realize that all along we have never had the relationship that we were supposed to have with them.
that God has for you. Amen? And I want all the men over on this side. And Rajiv, could you just put that video on? That, and just let that play in the background. And I want all the men over here. I want you to prepare your hearts to get to God's going to do something special for you today.